The next presenter we have is Jesse Adams with North Point Geographic Solutions, and his presentation is going to be about, be about Minnesota Compass and the Census API. So with that said, I will hand it over to Jesse. All right, sounds good. Can everybody hear me okay and hopefully see my screen? Yeah. Yes. All right, sounds good. I'm gonna have to rush here because Sam took all my time. Thanks a lot, Sam, appreciate that. Um, just kidding, I'll go fast. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about the Minnesota Compass webpage and um, this project that we've been working on with um, Minnesota Compass and the Wilder Foundation is who funds this project uh, behind the scenes and talk a little bit about kind of what they started with, what they're trying to get to and kind of the approach that we, that we took to get them from their kind of older API and what that was all about over to the new setup that uses a um, kind of reconfigured API and some hopefully nicer looking graphs and charts and tables and all that good stuff. So, so quick little outline, I'll just talk about what Minnesota Compass is all about, um, kind of the application modernization process and approach that we used utilizing the census API, and then take a look at the final results of um, Oh, I saw chats popping up uh, of, of what the uh, final product looked like and go from there. So let's go to the next one here. So Minnesota Compass Overview. Um, so this is a project of the Wilder Foundation. Um, so their mission is to provide easy access to demographic and economic data, uh, typically through the US Census and the American Community Survey data that, um, that we're probably all familiar with, um, as well as um, there's a few extra data sets with workforce information and commute times and that type of things that they, um, that they supplement the US Census and the ACS uh, data with. And then tracking that throughout time. So there's different years worth of data that, um, that we've had in this application um, from start until now. Um, and one of the things we're trying to build in is having that ability to each year when the census or when American Community Survey comes out with new data, uh, being able to quickly integrate and grab that new information and have that displayed to their end users as, as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, and so the other goal is to make, uh, to help policymakers, nonprofits, business, businesses, and community leaders uh, make def informed decisions based on, based on real-time data um, and have those decisions um, impact the lives and communities that they, that they serve. And so just a little bit about the data. So um, this will probably make more sense when we take a look at um, some of the data behind the scenes, as well as the kind of front end output that the uh, end users see. Um, but the way they decided on what data to display to their end users and what geographies was based on an advisory group of experts that recommended key measures that they felt had the highest impact um, on their decision-making process. Um, and so once the advisory groups had come up with their suggestions, the Wilder staff um, took as many of those suggestions as possible and based on the data that was available, kind of compiled a, a pretty good sized comprehensive list of all the statistics and demographic data for the um, geographies that we'll run through in more detail here in a little bit. And, um, you know, I guess making sure that the advisory groups were um, recommending key measures that were actually available with uh, census or ACS data as well. And then those uh, key measures are also uh, reviewed on a intermittent basis by those same advisory groups to make sure that the key measures are still relevant. So I'm gonna dig more into the technology side. Um, if there's questions on the data and kind of the history of the project, um, I can definitely try to find more information on that for you, but um, I'm gonna kind of focus more on my talk on the technology side, where it started, where, where we uh, brought it to, and then take a look at a few examples along the way here. So when we first came into this project, they had a front end, um, PHP page that was kind of hand coded, a lot of individual pages, like a individual page per city for the entire state of Minnesota. So, uh, geez, I can't even remember how many individual PHP pages or what, there was hundreds of PHP pages. So to update these pages would mean every time you'd want to make an update across each city or each county, depending on the you know, update that you're making for the statistics that are displayed on those pages, you'd have to go through every single page and update each one manually. Pretty hard to update, not exactly easy, straightforward, or quick to update and add and change information. 
on the front end side. On the back end, the API that they were using um, was a proprietary API that was mostly Python, a um, little bit of magic, a little bit of C++ and some fairy dust uh, kind of glued together that nobody really knew what was going on behind the scenes. Um, in fact, that was kind of one of our first tasks was to see if we could even get the old API to run and figure out the logic behind it to recreate it in a easier to understand, more maintainable manner. And yeah, that didn't go so well. <laughs> there was some proprietary libraries in there that just would not run without special special libraries and permissions and it was kind of a losing losing battle so we decided to revamp not only the front end but also the back end with uh, easier to understand easier to use technology um, easier to maintain um, and give them uh, more of the power to update the information moving forward so the updated technology on the front end is all drupal which we did not design the Drupal pages. Um, they worked with a web design company to come up with the uh, you know, front end design and look and feel and how the navigation and all that works, uh, which we'll look at too. Um, and then we mainly focused on the pages that had the mapping technology, which is using Esri's JavaScript API. Um, and then the tables of information down below that that interact with the map data simultaneously on the front end. And then on the back end, um, Typically, most of our server-side projects, we utilize Node.js just for the ease of having JavaScript on the front end and the back end. Um, and then we used a new little library that I had used before, but not all that extensively. And it's pretty slick. So if anybody has looked into or is interested in open source uh, JavaScript libraries, the Turf.js library is pretty slick little tool for doing spatial analysis um, in an open source manner using GeoJSON files and, and JavaScript. So it's pretty fast, pretty easy to, e easy to use, pretty easy to understand, and integrates really well with not only Node.js, but you could also put it on the front end if you're using just JavaScript in your, in your web browser. And then MongoDB for the database in the background or in the back end. Um, that's just a, a nice little uh, database that's really fast to interact with, stores native JSON format files and, and makes it easy to uh, retrieve and store uh, JSON data across the board with um, the data returns as well as what we get back from the census API too. And if we can take a quick peek at the census API here. So I'm not gonna do too much of a deep dive on kind of the, on the specifics of the census API, but, um, or I guess should say that American Community, Sur uh, Community Survey part of the Census API, um, but they do have a pretty robust uh, documentation list where you can find, you know, all the different details about the tables that are available, what all the statistics are, um, and then they go down into different subject tables, data profiles. You can even do some comparison profiles, um, but typically most of our stuff were, uh, comes from these detailed tables where you're requesting um, information about population or race breakdown or income breakdown, that type of thing can typically, uh, for the most part, is found in their detailed tables. And I'll kind of look at an example of that here in, in a minute as well. So a little bit of uh, a little bit of background about the geographies that are mapped. So they um, they had it break in, broken down into two main areas. So they have their special project areas, which included Duluth and the neighborhoods within Duluth, Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation, which is all of the areas that IRRR uh, manages. So um, range, North Shore area, um, anything from school districts to counties to um, overall entire IRRR boundary statistical and demographic information, um, which we'll look at uh, when we get to the demo part two. And then Minneapolis and St. Paul neighborhoods. So, um, which actually includes neighborhoods and communities in the Minneapolis and St. Paul uh, metropolitan area. And so the reason I point out these special project areas versus the standard geographies, which most of these are probably all familiar, familiar with state, county, city, uh, school district zip code, congressional districts, Senate districts, and census tracts. Um, all of these standard geographies, you can get that information directly from the API. You can say, give me the statistical information for whatever variables I'm requesting for the state of Minnesota or St. Louis County, um, and it'll return that information for you in a, in a JSON string that you can interpret and manipulate and do whatever else you want with. Um, the reason I bring up the special project areas 
um, are because they, those don't necessarily follow those standard geographic boundaries. So um, if we take the neighborhood of Lester Park in Duluth, um, that's not, you can't send a request to the census API and say, hey, I'd like to get Lester Park neighborhood information um, and demographic stats for Lester Park. They, they don't they don't have that as a standard geography. So we had to apply some methodology to take a non-standard geography and weight different portions of that geography um, to come up with a, an estimation of the statistics and demographics for that area. Okay, I guess I should have probably had that slide up, but um, special projects you utilize what, we're, what we call the apportionment method. And if you look up, um, if, or if you're familiar with Esri's uh, demographic um, geo-enrichment API that you know you can do through ArcGIS Online, where you can add um, demographic information to any standard or non-standard geographies, um, it uses a very similar methodology behind the scenes to um, apportion that data. And so if we dig into that a little bit more, um, this would be an example of, let's say this polygon right here, this kind of odd shaped polygon would be our non-standard geography. And that intersects for simplistic, I guess, example here, intersects four different tracks. So our first uh, kind of spatial operation is to do just a straight intersect, grab the tracks that intersect to that uh, study area. And then we do some apportionment beyond that, which I'll show here in a minute. Um, and then we apply the weighted centroid methodology to that. Oops, I wanna go the other direction. Let's, no. Nope. Thank you, Prezi. <laughs> Bouncing around. Okay, portion of many method continued. So, um, so we take that same example. Um, so we have our study area, we have all our tracks, and then what we do is we do a weighted block, uh, or a, apply a weighted block uh, calculation to each one of those sections of that study area to come up with a basically a percentage, a, a weighted percentage of that area that um, that we can weight our statistics on to hopefully be a little more accurate with non-standard geographies. So if you look at, let's say this tract right here, and we count up all the block centroids in there, we have flat five block centroids in there. Each one of those block centroids has, in, for ease of simple calculations in this example, each one of those has 10 people that they've reported inside each one of those blocks. And so we, let's see if we're looking at B1 here. So we look at this. So we grab, so we take our, uh, percentage in versus percentage out or number in versus number out. So 30 in, 50 out, which gives us our weight of 60%. Um, so that would be, so that block right there, that B1 would be weighted at 60%. So any of the statistics that we're grabbing from the census API for this tract, we would weight those values that are coming back um, with the factor of 60% um, or 0.6 and, and so on for each one of these other, other blocks depending, or each one of these other tracks, I should say, that intersect that area. So it gets a little bit tricky, but it's basically figuring out how much is in versus how much is out um, based on this weighted block calculation. And so then from there, so I'm gonna jump into a couple little examples here. So we'll take a look at the non-standard geographies, the standard geographies, and then we have um, a tool that, um, that we just released about a month ago or so that you can do some com combining standard and non-standard geographies and, and come up with some you know, combined uh, area statistics as well. So before I jump into those examples though, I'm not gonna get too in depth here. Although I know some of you have seen some of my other presentations and I might go a little too far in depth. So hopefully this, hopefully this isn't too in depth, but um, I just wanna show a quick example. This is using a little tool called Postman um, so that you can kind of see what the census API looks like in its raw form. And then what the API that we designed kind of wrapped around the census API will do. And just give you a little, um, I guess, sample of how they're similar and maybe how they're different as well. So you can see here, we're calling the census API from 2019 ACS, and we're doing the ACS five-year summary. So there are three-year and one-year summaries, but we are using the ACS five-year summary in this case. And then the three different parameters for our example that we'll look at here are um, this kind of strange, I guess, 
indicator would be the statistical value that we want to get or the um, you know the the census information that we want to get so in this case it's just straight population um, what state do we want to get that for so the FIPS code for Minnesota is 27 and in this case I'm just requesting a zip code tabulation area so I'm doing the eastern part of Duluth 55804 and if I send that off you'll see what we get back at least to me is a little bit confusing so one of the things our api does is transforms this array of arrays into into an object notation so it's a little bit easier to understand kind of more plain english uh labeling and everything too that we'll uh take a peek at here in a minute but um what this is saying is it's saying for this statistic which is our population for the state and zip code and then you match up each one of those positions in your resulting array so 14,907 is the population for the state of minnesota for zip code 55804 and you could change that to you know, 5512 and that'll give us the um that'll give us the population for 55812 um so that's kind of what the api does uh just out of the box you know raw return and so what we did is we took that information and we tried to make it a little more user friendly and of course passed in a lot more variables um to give us some not only easier to understand statistics that are coming back but also um combining those values with the margin of error uh, percentages if there's you'll see when we look at the um uh, kind of main output there's some nice tables and it'll give you percentages of you know total population versus populations of different age breakdowns and race breakdown um, and that type of thing so it'll do a lot of those calculations behind the scenes in the api based on the uh, information that you're requesting so this is the api we put together this is the gis minnesota compass api uh, version one profiles and we tried to make it as simple as possible. So passing in a name of the area we want to get, a cache value. So this is true or false, and I'll talk about that in a minute here. And then an area type. So um, one of the things, and we'll see what um, Minnesota Compass and the Wilder Foundation would like to do, but this isn't really a, I guess, public facing API right now. It's mainly geared towards their um, Drupal pages and their profiles that display this information coming back from the API. but um, at some point, um, you know, if they want to release this API to a general wider audience, um, you know, we'd, we'd have a document, we'd have documentation that says, you know, if you're requesting cities, you need to pass in place. If you're requesting, you know, a county, you have to pass in county. So it's basically a flag that specifies what geography type are we requesting for that, for that, um, for that request that we're sending. So in this case, I'm getting statistics for Grand Rapids. I want the cache data to be true and our geography area type is place and actually we'll send that again just to show you how quick it is comes back with all these statistics and you can see the return is a little bit different you know we tried to kind of normalize these variables and make them i guess a little more human readable so our total population total male total female and there's hundreds and hundreds of these <laughs> values but they're pretty well standardized into name of the statistic the value the value margin of error, the percentage, if it shows up in a table, and then the percentage error margin as well. And so there's tons of these that are coming back, but the, in fact, there's hundreds of lines. And then down at the bottom, there's even some graphing information too that um, isn't, is, is really just a combination of some of the st statistics earlier in the stats that it's returning, but um, these are bound to graphs on the front end so we can have some comparison and some graphing of the information that's being returned from the API. So I just do a quick change here. Let's change this to, we'll say, we'll do that Lester Park example. So if I wanted to get Lester Park, this is gonna be Duluth. And that, and now we get our statistics for Lester Park. And so, from the end user, they're not actually seeing what's going on with that apportionment method uh, with the API too. So, because I'm using Lester Park and that's a non-standard geography, it's returning this information based on that apportionment method. My previous Grand Rapids example, that was using straight straight calls to the census API and returning data in that fashion. Um, 
The last thing I forgot to mention here is this cache. So that's, um, so we have a true or false option there. If you want to request fresh information directly from the census API, so it'll go out, get that information in real time when you hit send or request it through the web page, I can change that to false. Um, it does take 30 to 40 seconds or so to get information, depending on the size of the area and whether you're using apportionment or not. Um, so what we did is we implemented a cache I guess, mechanism behind the scenes. So the very first time that area is requested, it'll go to the census API, grab it, it puts it into a cache table. And then any subsequent time someone requests that information, it'll just pull up that cached inf information and give that to the user within, oh, let's see, it's pretty quick here, then half a second. So, um, or less than half a second even. Um, so it makes it a lot, a lot faster than going directly to the API, but could put that in there if we wanted to. And let's see, I'll show these resulting profiles here. And I'm almost out of time. But I did wanna show you what the end user will see when they navigate to the Minnesota Compass page. I see if you end up going a little bit over, a little bit past three, that's fine. Okay, sounds good. And I'm just gonna open up the rest of these while we're at it here. Okay, so we'll start with the Duluth one here. So this is the um, one of their st uh, specific study area uh, pages. So if you look at the explored data, you can kind of see that breakdown that I mentioned earlier, Duluth neighborhoods, IRRR, and Minneapolis, St. Paul neighborhoods. So those are their focused areas that are pretty much all based on uh, that apportionment method because they're non-standard geographies. So if we look at our Lester Park example here, um, the mapping side of this is, Pretty simple, there's not much to it. You know, it just gives you a little map, it gives you a, a hyperlink over to that specific page uh, for that neighborhood. And you can also do some pretty simple things like change the symbology to median household income. Um, nothing too fancy there. The majority of the information on the other hand, if we choose Lester Park from here, this should, once I refresh the page, there we go. Um, this should, this is the, this is where all the data that comes back from that API is displayed. So we have um, different graphs, which there again, a lot of the kind of UI design around this was not, was put together in Drupal by a web design company. And really the part that we were in charge of is hydrating these statistics that you see in each one of these graphs. And then all of the information down below. So if we expand all that, we should be able to see that value should look familiar. That was the same value that we saw when we looked at the raw raw return, but just formatted in a nice page now where you can see the population breakdown, uh, male, female breakdown, race information. Oh, this is a good example. So if there's, if the margin of error is at a point that, um, that the data is too specific, like they, you know, didn't want to point out very specific parts of or pieces of information that could be traced back to individual households uh, for certain, usually smaller areas that would um, have small values. Um, so we have an algorithm behind the scenes that says if it's, you know, higher than this, uh, than a certain percentage of margin or error, error margin, then, you know, make sure you put suppressed in there. Um, so that's why you probably see that for some of the race and ethnicity breakdown for Lester Park. Um, so I won't scroll through that whole thing. You can feel free to navigate to mncompass.org and check out all their all their data they have there. Um, the last two, I just wanted to point out where the standard geographies are. So um, they also have their standard geographies, cities, counties, region, state, um, all that good stuff at the top there. And if we click on one of these, we'll just grab a Noka here so I don't have to scroll down too far. Very similar look and feel um, to the custom special project profile pages. However, the only, I guess, main difference is that the statistics that you're seeing here are coming directly from the census API versus that apportionment method that's estimating the demographic values for um, kind of non-standard non -standard geographies. And then the last one, which I think is probably the coolest one because it has a map on it and that's a little more interactive um, is the build your own. So this is, one that we just released about a month here or so. Um, and really what it allows the user to do is to choose well, not only ways to grab a, um, you know, a single profile worth of information. So if you just wanted St. Louis County, 
you know, it'll give you just St. Louis County and there's all the information for just St. Louis County. Otherwise you can do some pretty cool stuff. Like you can start combining geographies. If you're curious, you know, what, what does it look like if I combine these five counties um, into one area? I don't know, how, what are the demographic statistics look like? So what it'll do is it'll on the fly, it'll go out to this same exact API and it'll grab all, of, all five of these counties and it'll squish together all of their uh, statistics and give you an overall profile for that entire area combined. So it'll be a combined, um, combined profile. And then the second tab over here, well, I should point out the kind of three different categories here. So um, under statewide, a lot of these are gonna be the standard geographies that, um, that we talked about. We also have a few extra ones here that they wanted to add in for economic development reasons. So economic development regions, the Minnesota Initiative uh, Foundation regions. Um, so you can get statistics on those and you can also combine those geographies with other geographies if you wanted to um, and get a kind of large overall combination profile for combinations of any of these for that matter. Um, or we also have the uh, Twin City specific, which also show up on the Twin Cities page. So there's a little bit of cross between the um, custom tools and the, um, uh, what do you call it? The standard standard geography or the custom geography pages, I should say, special project pages. So let's see here. If we wanted to do census tracts, I know what I was showing. Okay, so we did already looked at the combine. You can also compare as well. So if we wanted to compare... I'm gonna say zip codes instead, that's a little bit better. So if we wanted to compare East Duluth with West Duluth, or no, I'm probably saying that wrong. Drew can correct me if I'm saying it wrong. Is it West Duluth, Lincoln Park? <laughs> I'm not from Duluth, so I probably say that wrong. And I know I've been corrected multiple times. <laughs> so someone can correct yes. me if I say West Duluth, okay. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so we can compare those two different, uh, those two different zip codes. Uh, in a table next to each other as well to kind of do a visual comparison between two different geographies of the same type in a nice little profile page that has them stacked next to each other. And then the last one, this one allows us to draw custom geography. Um, so right now we do have a little bit of a limitation on this tool where um, the draw, as it mentions here, are currently limited only 25 square miles. Um, and the reasoning behind that is that the census API just takes too long to process giant areas on the fly, um, which is something we're working on trying to do some different caching, I guess, things behind the scenes in order to cache some of that census API to make it faster. But if we wanted to do, let's say, a point and a radius, Let's just do a point. I don't know. We'll choose a intersection here, and then let's say we wanted to do a one mile buffer around that. What it'll do on the fly is it'll create that buffer, and then behind the scenes, it's going out to that API, it's sending this custom geography, the circle, um, out to the API, and it's running it through that apportionment method in real time. And with any luck, if it doesn't air out, we should see some statistics displayed down below based on that one mile radius that we drew on the map at that point. Perfect, there we go. So there's our geography and there's our apportioned statistics for all the same um, same information. Although there's a few, although, oh, I see why. So I drew an area that was too small. So one of the things you will see that I forgot to mention um, is if the area is too small, uh, it won't go out and get the full list of statistics. It'll do an abbreviated list based on the um, census summary files. So because I didn't draw a very large area, the number of statistics that it's able to get are a little bit truncated, but it's still, still should be accurate to that area based on that apportionment method and also based on the real-time live census API information. All right, and so I just have one last slide here that I have to throw in. <laughs> um, so if anybody's curious, the funders for the projects, um, all the Duluth profiles are listed below the Duluth profiles there, and then um, Blandon Foundation, McKnight Foundation, and the Morgan Family Foundation um, are all funders for the Minnesota Compass project through the Wilder Foundation as well. And I believe that is all I had.